event is really twofold. Um, one, of course, is to see to see this fantastic project. Uh, the other, what we call 2020 today in Romania, and achieving net zero energy homes in 2014. And I'll explain a little bit more about our, 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 why we chose this topic uh, for today. Um, this is something I want to explain why, as Romania Green Building Council, when we look at what we consider green buildings, we set a very high standard uh, for green buildings. And I'll explain the flower in just a moment. I don't know what I did. I'll get this switched off at the but before I do, just very quickly, uh, and I, I won't go through all the, the challenges of our global environment. I think many people understand the, the planetary challenges, but just, just one, one idea. Uh, this is a map of global income distribution. So we have about 7 billion people on the planet today. And the blue is the, the wealthiest, the, the red is the uh, middle income, and the yellow is the low income. And so we have different uh, phenomena. One, of course, uh, despite the sort of challenging economics of the last four or five years, uh, the poverty is decreasing, wealth is increasing, uh, and, and wealth is really distributing around the world, which means consumption is, is growing as well. Uh, and then on top of that, we have the entire pie is getting bigger. We're moving to 8 billion, uh, soon to be 9 billion, and debates on where we'll stop, but uh, even numbers as high as 10 billion people on the planet. And if we talk about this, uh, this is, in our opinion, building buildings that are less bad than our current buildings is not going to solve the problem. <clears throat> if we have 9 billion people on the planet and everybody consuming, we don't want to be in a situation where we all have to have uh, worse lifestyles uh, and really reduce uh, uh, what we do. We want to have uh, a good quality of life. And to do that, I think we can think of the terms of, of a standard which says what is, uh, what, what is a good metaphor for how a building should perform. And what we like to use, this is from the Living Building Challenge, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic metaphor, is that a building should operate and have the impact of a flower on the environment. And what does a flower do? It, 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 of course, it consumes green energy. Uh, also, it's non-toxic, at least uh, to the environment. It, some, some are toxic, but it is a natural, 100% uh, natural, of course. Uh, it's also very relevant to its location. And this is something we'll, we'll talk about more. And then very important, if we have 8 billion people, 9 billion people on the planet, and we want to live better, uh, if we have less bad buildings, it's going to cause a problem. But if we have more flowers, uh, this should be a good thing. Then there's some good news of how do we get to these types of buildings. In, at the European level, there's some policy direction. One is called net zero energy by, tw by 2020. Uh, this requires that the buildings basically must have far superior energy efficiency, and that ener any energy that they do use should be offset by green energy. That's the basic idea. Uh, in this 2020 date, uh, this is the target date that all private buildings uh, must follow this standard. Uh, and it's actually two years earlier for public buildings. Also, construction waste, 70% must be diverted from landfill. Currently, it's about 25% of construction waste. And construction is 25% of all waste uh, in Europe. Uh, so this is a, a radical change from where we are today. And there's also what we call REACH legislation, which talks about what is allowed, the, tox the toxic chemicals allowed in our building materials, and also what we have to say about those building materials. So that's coming in much stronger and very soon. So this is, this is the good news. The challenge is, just like all European legislation, we need, uh, we have what, 28 member states now, and we need people to actually support these. Because we as an organization for Romania Green Building Council, our fear is that as we get to 2020, it becomes not net zero energy, but nearly net zero energy, and then becomes cost effective nearly net zero energy, then mostly cost-effective kind of net-zero energy, and by the way, we need five more years to do it. 
So, and, and it looks very important is Romania, like many countries in Europe, is expected to resist this legislation and is expected to push for a lighter standard. And we want to argue why that's not in our best interest in Romania and why it's really not there. So if we can turn this, the discussion around in Romania and, and create wonderful buildings here, we, we do one, two things. One, of course, we change from a, a, a somebody against to someone supporting, but we also inspire a lot of other countries uh, to do the same, and we make it a little more challenging. So that's why what, what Romanian Green Building Council, we have the 2020 Today campaign, which is how can we support and how can we promote projects that reach this level and do it today. And also you know, across all building types, offices, retail, healthcare, and of course, homes. Our scope is all buildings, uh, but, but we, we need to basically bring forth wonderful examples in all of these areas. And by doing so, we're, we will shift the debate. Instead of saying, this is difficult, but let's put some reports together and see if it's feasible, we're going to present to the market real projects with real people living in them, and four or five years ahead of schedule, it's going to be very difficult to tell so that people can say, well, sorry, Romania, we can't do it. It's not possible. So we want them to be technical successes, economic successes, and aesthetic, I mean, or beautiful successes. And I think we have that here today. Also, without going into too much details on policy, uh, my opinion is typically policies, uh, green policies are, are really fantastic legislation. It doesn't happen only because we have one visionary policymaker. Typically, business has helped innovate and brought down the cost of that policy innovation. So it's very important that we can show that the business uh, community wants this legislation and the consumers want this legislation. And everybody will benefit. And that's, I think, again, what we're proving here today. And, and what I consider great news about green buildings, and not just less bad buildings, but the highest possible definition of green, is that we don't have any barriers. We don't have any barriers in this country to do the best buildings uh, in the world from a green perspective. Our buildings are a systemic problem with a systemic solution, and this is for all countries of the world. It is not just that architects don't know how to build green, or engineers don't, or that the banks don't understand them, or the lawyers don't know how to write contracts. It's, it's all of the above. And it's a systemic problem. This is a lot why our organization attempts to bring everybody together so that we can talk and sort through these, these issues uh, uh, together. One of the systemic problems when we measure our buildings in Romania, and this is actually a lot of other countries in Europe as well, is we have an A on the energy audit, which does not actually, uh, gives actually a pretty wide range uh, from a, a building like you're in today to uh, a building that is that is actually not very energy efficient at all. And one of the concerns we hear from a lot of investors and developers is that if I invest in this, but I can't explain to the consumer, or the consumer doesn't understand the difference, then I'm at a disadvantage. So we think it's very important for Romania to have, uh, uh, to have uh, a much better way to show uh, the, the real performance of the building, not only from an energy perspective, environmental perspective, but from an economic perspective. And there is some work on the, the energy audit itself, uh, which maybe we could talk to talk, talk about af after um, we do the presentations, uh, to, to have a, a more uh, robust energy audit process with, with different uh, gradations. But we have uh, developed a green home certification project, uh, project that uh, takes a very uh, uh, a look at uh, only the very highest performing uh, green buildings and certifies them as a green home. And I'll talk about that more in just a moment. The other part of the systemic problem, if we look at from the, the, the financing side of the equation, how do we finance our homes? And I'll talk about sort of, you can overfinance, you have some countries that typically overfinance, others that underfinance. Uh, I come from the United States, we have a problem, we typically overfinance real estate. If we can afford this home, we buy this home, it's okay, it will all work out, we can borrow the money, I'll figure it out later, life will be better. Obviously we know from the financial crisis 
I, I think some lessons were learned. I'm not, I'm not sure all the lessons were learned. Uh, but, but one thing, but Americans tend to think, can I afford the monthly payments? I have my income paid monthly, and can, what's, what's that ratio to, and can I afford this? That's really, really the way they think. Uh, a lot of the world thinks about cost per square meter of construction. And I think that would include here. And again, I think in Romania, and I think in most of the world, there's a fear of bank financing. Yeah, if we think about it, someone is willing to give you a large amount of money at the beginning of the home buying process. And for that, they want an interest paid to them, and if you can't pay them, they'll take the home. It's a little bit frightening, but the reality is they're enabling a transaction uh, that might not otherwise occur. And, but there's also a big benefit uh, to looking at it this way. And we look at the, let's talk about the cost of, of not trying to uh, uh, finance properly a project. We have a lot of projects, uh, yeah, I would say most of the world, where it's done with friends and family, it's done with the cash that you have in a bank account, and it's done in a way to make sure that you don't owe anybody any money, it's your house. But there's a problem with that. And I think we know the stories. I mean, th look at the, the types of uh, 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 solutions that will drive a lot of cost in the very near future. And you end up having sort of American-sized houses, but with not the energy efficiency. So you're literally actually paying a lot more than, uh, than the average American would pay on a similar size home. And that, of course, that creates a lot of economic challenges. So that, again, I'd say that the challenge here is that we're underfinancing our construction. And this is what we, we talk about a green mortgage product that we developed. Uh, this is uh, the intention of this. Basically, we're not rational people. That you know, all humans, I mean, Romanians, Greeks, Americans, we're just not rational when it comes to short-term benefit versus long-term benefit. We know, and this goes across a lot of different things, we know that if we're going to, uh, that saving money in the future, uh, we discount that compared to saving money right now. It's just, it's just normal. Um, but of course it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's better for you. So how do we convert long-term benefit into immediate benefits we can see? And this again, this is where the green mortgage comes along. And I'll talk a little bit more detail about how it works. When we think about where does the interest rate you're charged for a mortgage come from? Of course, the bank borrows at a certain amount of money to loan you the money. That, that uh, affects it. But also there's their cost of doing business. What if you don't pay them? That affects, of course, uh, the interest rate. And also, what if they have to take back the home? They prefer to have the monthly payments made on time, but they may have to take back the home. And if they, the home they take back is less valuable than the amount of money they loaned you, they have a big problem, which again drives up the interest rate. Also, energy is a high priority payment. It's very clear if you don't pay your energy bill, it's possible that you don't have energy the next month. So it is it typically uh, a, a, a proportionally higher priority than other expenses. In fact, I think only Slovakia is energy priority <coughs> uh, more in, in the European Union as a percentage of household budgets. There's also, energy is not the only cost of, of a house. You have health costs. The number one cause of bankruptcy is not losing your job. It's the health issue, uh, the health issue of yourself or a loved one, which makes a lot of sense. Are you going to pay the bank for your house, or are you going to pay the doctor to save you or a loved one's life? So health is, of course, uh, the ability to work, etc., is, is a very important cost. <clears throat> also, the repair costs. We could talk, I think, a day or two on, on the subject, but one, one thing for a very quick example. A lot of houses are destroyed by water infiltration, particularly when you have freezing and unfreezing that happens 10 or 12 times uh, per season or more. Uh, and just solving that uh, that you find in high-quality building produces a lot less stress on the house. And if you have 3 to 5% cost of repair of the, uh, of the house, if you take the asset value of the house and add 3 to 5% as your annual repair cost, and you can cut that in half, it's a fantastic amount of savings. It's money in your pocket. 
And, and if you don't do the repairs, your asset value drops. So this, these are all positive economic contributions. Now if we get, we look now quickly from the bank's point of view, if I give you a quick example, and we have two borrowers who, who buy a house with a mortgage, and one has a friend, and one doesn't have a friend. And the guy with a friend, that friend makes three mo monthly mortgage payments uh, for you each year. And the guy without a friend, he has to pay it all himself. If you were the bank, who do you think would be a better risk? And I should say, they both have the same incomes. I, I didn't mention it. I think it's pretty clear you want the guy who has that friend making the payment. In this case, your friend is the energy savings of a green home, and also those other costs, the, the health <coughs> costs, the, the, the reduced repair costs. And we'll show you. It's, 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 again, we're not rational people. We think about what we're paying right now. We don't think about in the future. We have this, this research, 32% uh, uh, drop in mortgage defaults for green homes. So almost one-third uh, uh, improvement in mortgage portfolios that are writing mortgages on green homes. And also, the, the greener the house, the better the repayment rate. So that this is, the 32% is at the base level of green, which is actually a lower standard than what we, uh, we are applying uh, through our Green Homes program. Also, 8% higher asset values, that's for new construction, goes up even higher for renovations. And so there's a significantly lower risk in the bank's mortgage portfolio. So we asked the banks involved in our program to, to pass that along. So if we get the homeowners looking at the total monthly cost of ownership, now this can really facilitate green home purchases. So I'll go through quickly here the, the energy demand of the home you're in right now. Also, uh, and, and which outperforms our standard for green mortgage qualified home. Uh, we'll compare it to the energy A, that's <coughs> from the Romanian methodology, and the energy C, which we would argue that many of the houses we're, we're comparing to now are actually C performance. And I think many of you also know people who have uh, you know, very substantial uh, operating costs, particularly, of course, in winter and summer. So we have basically in, in the, I think, 30, 31, 34 uh, kilowatts per, per month. For uh, sure. Yes, I think that's the... Yeah. Uh, the, uh, compared to over 300 kilowatts on, on the... the um, uh, average home, let's say. So it's a, a very substantial difference. And again, we'll have this this research you can download from from our site. So so uh, I won't go into to to all the details, just so we can spend some more time looking at the house. But um, also the total annual cost of energy per square meter per year, when you have three to four uh, euros per square meter versus uh, 17, 18, it's a, a very significant difference. And the total annual cost of energy for the home, uh, also very substantial. And so we have, basically, the green home certification is the trigger to the partner bank to allow these uh, lower cost mortgages. And just to give you an example, uh, we compare the, the cost of the base home from uh, Amber Gardens with, the, uh, with, with this average home in, in the region, looking at numbers of comparable prices uh, of, of other homes. Uh, so we have 244 square meters, uh, total cost 230,000 for the home. Uh, the loan is uh, 195,000, um, and the loan value for the standard mortgage 5.5 percent, and for the green mortgage 4.7 percent. Repayment period is 25 years, uh, and the yearly payment 14,560 for the C home, and 13,457 uh, 13, for Amber Gardens, and the monthly payment. 
compares uh, 1,213 for the C-rated home to 1,121 uh, for Amber Gardens. So even just looking at the, the mortgage rate, before we talk about energy savings, uh, you're saving money uh, instantly. And that doesn't, this is not, we don't talk about payback periods of four years, seven years, depending on certain pieces of equipment. This is when you get your first invoice from the bank, the first payment request to pay your mortgage. So it's instantaneous uh, savings. And if we look at the, the, the whole picture, the net savings with the green mortgage, so we have the, the down payment, the monthly mortgage payment, the reduction of the monthly payment uh, compared to the C-home is 92 euros a month in your pocket every month for 25 years. It's a lot of money. You also then have the cost of the energy, uh, 324 to 52. And when you compare them, and the monthly energy savings and the total cost of ownership, you have $363 difference each month. And this is the, the net annual cost of 4361 uh, 4, uh, is money in your pocket uh, for buying a green home of this level. It's a very significant, significant savings. And the total cost of ownership between the energy cost, even before the, the mortgage payment plus the energy, so this home would be less than just the mortgage on the C home. So if we really think about what we're looking at here, is we're, we're, we're basically paying less for a lot more. We can look at the, the problem another way. If we set the energy equal to each other for both of these houses, and you said, okay, for that amount of annual cost, uh, that you have to pay for the C home. That is like having a 1.7 uh, increase, 1.7 percent increase in your mortgage payment for the non-green home. It's a very substantial difference, particularly if you go over 25 years. So I think this is this is a, maybe another more helpful way to look at it. So with that, I, I definitely want you to hear a little bit more about the house. Um, I would just like to say, for our organization, we're really um, it was very inspiring to, 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 to meet Alice Sonora and to see their work in progress and, and to see the results and, and also to hear about their, their plans for the future because I think this is, this is really the type of project exactly that fits within uh, our am most ambitious uh, standard. It actually exceeds our standard and I think it's a, a, real, uh, uh, a real accomplishment by your team. And, uh, and we're really looking forward to the success of this project and, and uh, I wish you the most success. So with that, I will, and we'll have a bunch more flowers around the world because of that. Uh, so with that, Livius, I'll turn it over to you. To Always, I feel that the, the Romanian Green Building loves our project even more than we do every time that uh, we do. So let me tell you a few things, a small story of the project and how it started. In 2007, with uh, my partners, we came in this area. We saw the area and we liked it. It was the infrastructure that was happening uh, towards this direction that was uh, seen promising. The area was developing. We had clean air, the forest behind. It was for us an ideal location in order to develop. Back then, uh, the whole area was developing, but then crisis came and the development stopped. Fortunately, the infrastructure of the city didn't. The infrastructure of the city really uh, exploded towards this direction. So, a few years later, after discussing with uh, my partners on what we, could, what we could do, having an experience as a lesson from 2003 in building apartments in the middle of the city, we saw this as a challenge uh, and an opportunity at the same time. We said, let's move to the next level. Let's move to build houses. Then we start discussing about the houses and what uh, we should build and what the market will need. And we always had the, uh, we, we always wanted to build something that would be green, something sustainable. And that was always a challenge to do it inside the city. We said, this is our opportunity. So why not, not to just try to do houses, 
like everyone else is doing, but to try to do the one step further that we need. So we set our design philosophy. Bioclimatic design is something that I believe it's much easier to do it outside of the city than inside the city where you are always limited by orientation, the street, uh, small spaces, etc. Coming outside is something that you can really use and I will explain in a while what I mean. Then we said let's find a standard which is a very high standard for energy efficiency. Looking around we ended up to the passive power standard which we considered that was the highest standard for energy efficiency. Obviously, there was a lot of technology which we have used in previous projects and to this one that we consider that makes our life much more comfortable inside the house. And then health. We cannot imagine a luxury home that doesn't provide a healthy environment for the inhabitants. Space. There was the main problem that we saw is that many houses which are being built around Bucharest, they have small gardens, they have very tight roads and in general they are not very generous in the spaces that they are providing. And then privacy. One of the main things and the main reasons that we believe people would live from the comfort that the city is providing with all the amenities they have around is to go somewhere where they can feel that they have their own space. There are barbarians. They don't even turn their houses facing the sun. This is what Eschilo said two and a half thousand years ago. Of course, as Greeks, we have this tendency of calling anyone not Greek a barbarian. So we're trying to, uh, to, to find characteristics that they didn't fit with our culture back then. But this tells us something. This tells us that bioclimatic design was something that people were using for a very, very long time, even before uh, it was the only way they were able to create a comfortable space before the Industrial Revolution. Afterwards, things became much easier. People started moving in the cities, we started solving everything with energy. So, if we were staying against nature, we were pumping a bit more energy, and that was solving everything. In Bucharest, there is, uh, we have, um, examining the area and the nature, we saw that there, are, there is the opportunity to take advantage of the natural elements. So, orientation. As you will notice in this house and in all the houses, all the houses are facing south. Where we are standing south is the best orientation. Why? Because it gives us the opportunity to harvest the winter sun that is low in the horizon. And then, by smart covering the, the windows, we can, um, we can protect the house from the summer uh, hot weather. Then the main wind direction in this area is the northeast. You will notice that towards the northeast we have evergreen trees that actually are slowing down all the strong winter winds that uh, exist in the area. Then thermal mass. Romania and Bucharest has the advantage of having a big difference of day and night temperature. Sometimes even in the summer you see a difference of more than 10 degrees. This gives us the opportunity to harvest the, the heat during the day and then give it back to the space during the night. And then obviously you cannot imagine a house outside of the city not taking advantage of a garden around the house. So in our case, when we designed the house, we designed it in a complete association with a garden. That's why also you would notice that we have planted the trees in such a way and there are trees that are losing their leaves, they are deciduous trees that will permit in the winter all the sun to come inside and then in the summer creating a very comfortable shadow that is cooling the space not only uh, south of the house but it's cooling the space outside. Going to the passive house uh, principles, at the beginning we were considering that it will be quite easy. We were saying we'll take some principles, adapt them to the house and here you are, you have a house. It took us a bit more than that. The passive house is mainly focused on two main things, except of the bioclimatic part that I just explained. That's the very well insulated house. In our case, and in all our houses, we have used uh, 20 centimeters of uh, polystyrene, and in some cases, we have used also polystyrene, which is graphite that has a higher, um, higher efficiency. And the reason is that we were aiming 
to have uh, heat transfer ratio of the walls of under 0.15 uh, watts per square meter. And at the same time, we have used uh, the glasses and the profiles, which are, uh, uh, which are of the highest standard we can find in the market, so to be able to be under the 0.8 watts that the passive house is actually uh, imposing. And then another big problem of houses is the thermal bridges. You always have part of the houses which are exposed to the exterior, are exposed to cold. So you need the special design details in order to be able to create and break this connection of materials that are not isolating with the exterior. The air tightness is another issue. We have tried to avoid any leakages that could exist in a house. This means leakages between joints of windows and walls. These leakages through piercing in the walls for cables. Uh, and then uh, connections between uh, materials like the bricks and the concrete. These leakages, it's how sometimes normal houses are uh, let's say, uh, having their, uh, their air exchange, having, uh, having their fresh air coming in the house. I, was, I remember when I was young, they were telling me, it's okay to have a few leakages because it's, it's actually better. You have a fresh air inside. Obviously, this comes with a cost. And it doesn't come with such a high cost in Greece, where I grew up, because okay, the worst thing that we can see is temperatures of five degrees during the winter, so we, we, are, we are quite quite okay, quite comfortable. But in Romania, that costs a lot. So in order for us to ensure a very high quality of the air inside, we are using um, a heat exchanger, which actually exchanges the air, the consumed air, by bringing fresh air inside, and at the same time recovering all the heat, 90% of it, of the heat that uh, we have inside the space. That way we are able to, uh, heat the, to, to keep the heat in the space all year round, bringing fresh air continuously and not having to open a window with minus 15 degrees outside that would actually create a huge cold draft for the house. Except of this, we have used some uh, technology that we consider that doesn't only help us in efficiency but also helps us in uh, having a space which is much more comfortable. Therefore, we ended up to uh, a heat pump with a COP of more than three, which actually means that for every kilowatt hour of electricity that is being uh, uh, consumed, there are three kilowatt hours of heat or uh, cool uh, that uh, is being produced. Then are the heating panels. As you can notice around the space, you will see no radiators. We consider that the heating panels that it's actually being installed in the ceiling and they are invisible uh, and they are using water as a source of, uh, of heat are creating a very unified temperature all over the space so it doesn't matter if I stay next to the window or if I stay in the other part of the, um, of the house anyway the windows are very well insulated so even if I stay here in this house it doesn't really make a difference but in other houses when you are staying next to the radiator, you feel a lot of heat, and then when you are moving away, you are feeling cold drafts from everywhere. So with the heating panels, what you are actually uh, getting is having the exact same temperature all over the space. And that doesn't work well just for heating, it works very well also for cooling. So one of the major problems of people inside their houses is in the night when they go to sleep, they always close, turn off their air conditioning because they feel a cold draft or they wake up and they are sick. So in our case, the feeling that you have is just a very cool space without having all these uh, problems. Then for bathrooms, where we have cold materials, like uh, stone or uh, travertine in our case, uh, we have underfloor heating, which creates a very comfortable uh, feeling. Then, for the living room, there is an inverter system, which in case that you have a lot of people, like today, and you need instant uh, uh, cold air, you can turn it on and cool the space uh, instantly. The smart home application, it's something that a lot of people are asking nowadays. Everything turns digital. So, in all our houses, we are giving the opportunity to people to control their heat 
and control the heat ventilate the um, heat exchanger through the internet. And in the showroom, we have also added a smart home application for all the lighting and all the um, uh, uh, window shutters. So people can control it from that. The central vacuum system is my favorite. It's a silent system compared to a traditional uh, vacuum uh, system, which actually creates a very healthy environment inside because it doesn't just uh, vacuum all the uh, all the dust and then pass it through a filter and throws it back in the space. But it takes all this dust and throws it outside of the house, so that reduces a lot the effect of asthma or allergies that people uh, have. Solar water panels. Obviously, we needed to use uh, renewable energy to heat the house. The solar water panels is one of the most efficient ways. We are using the, uh, the solar panels not just for hot water, but we are using it also for heating. Then, in case the client wants, we can provide him photovoltaic panels. Now, the great thing about it is that because of the very, very low energy consumption that we have in this house, with photovoltaic panels, we can be today where Steve said that the European Union wants us to be in 2020. So what we are proving is that it is feasible to have a net zero energy building now, not in six years from now. And then another cool thing that I'm sure you all know because it's quite often used in Romania, it's anti-freezing system for the winter, so when you have uh, uh, when you have snow, you don't have to actually clean everything in order to be able to move your car, take your children to school or go at work. And as I said before, we cannot imagine a luxury house that it's not a healthy house. And for us, a healthy environment means an, uh, an environment that has a, a low uh, volatile uh, organic components in the, in the paint, or not at all, as is the case. It has a continuous air exchange through the devices that I have already explained to you. There is natural light in all the rooms. And actually, in this project, we have very big windows towards the south for all the main rooms. And then all the other, even secondary rooms of the house, they have at least a small opening in order to have natural light. And then quiet environment. I don't know but if you have noticed, but there are some works done outside. Still, I'm sure you are not listening yet. And then people moving outside, they definitely want a large garden. They want a garden where their children can move out, they can play, they can be in, uh, in contact with nature. It's not enough to, green, to build a green bee. You have to make people like it and give them what they don't have except of them. One of the main reasons I believe that people do not move so much to green is because, unfortunately, alone doesn't make a difference. The reason, because as you said, Steve, we are looking the short term, not the long term effects. So, what we try to do is to create a project which is better than what we were finding all around the area. So, in our case, we have at least 50% more land given to every single house than any other a luxury big development. Our streets are much wider. That's the main problem of uh, projects in uh, Pipera. They have very narrow streets serving a lot of houses. And then going in the interior of the house, we consider that storage room is a very important element of the house. So we provide the storage room on every single floor. Privacy. Again, privacy is something that we consider extremely important for people that will take the decision to leave the comfort of the city and move outside. So, orientation, it doesn't, really, it doesn't only help us for the efficiency and energy efficiency and harvesting the sun. It helps us also because all the houses create a unique relation with their own garden, but no relation with the houses around. If you are looking outside, you will see that no other house has a major opening or a major window facing this garden. All the houses are connecting just with their own garden, not with the houses around. To this, it helps us also the big streets that we have. 
and the tree alignment that we have on the streets. This creates an even bigger, uh, let's say, uh, covering of everyone's land. Now, not to be misunderstood, it's not that we are not creating a community. People always feel that moving outside of the city, they will move in a community. But at the same time, they want their own space. They want to be part of something, but also when they feel that they want to be uh, alone with their family, they want to be sure that they're not disturbing or they're not being disturbed by others. And then, last is the green fence. The green fence is something that we consider that could unify the whole image of the project and at the same time giving the possibility to every single client to create his own uh, fence, his own height and without actually having limitations on what he can use, but at the same time creating a unified image. So, seven years later, after a lot of work from Andre, Theodora, Remus and Florin, and uh, Orestes and Alex and myself, that we struggle a lot more than what we consider that we would struggle at the beginning. So, seven years later, two and a half years after doing just a project, and one and a half year more than what initially we anticipated in constructing it, we ended up in a healthy environment in a bioclimatic passive house which is technologically advanced, spacious and private and also awarded from the Annual Architecture in 2013. So, we took the road less travelled by and we hope that will make all the difference.